from Washington to Warsaw, Paris to Ankara, Brussels, Berlin, Bucharest, and Belgrade. Their pandemics and political movements, cooperation and confrontation, digital divides, and defending democracy. The German Marshall Fund is at the pulse of transatlantic relations today, convening the experts and insights needed to navigate tomorrow's world. Derek Chalet, the Executive Vice President at the German Marshall Fund of the United States. And it gives me great pleasure to welcome uh, here for this book talk, my friend, Suzanne Nossel. Uh, Suzanne is the author of a, of a wonderful and very powerful new book entitled Dare to Speak, Defending Free Speech for All. And, and I read this book as an e-book. Uh, and so I have only a paper version of the cover. There you go, Suzanne. But it, that's what it looks like. Um, it's, it is a very, very important book, particularly for this moment where uh, debates over free speech have been roiling the, the political conversation, media organizations, businesses, uh, think tanks, uh, as well as table, table conversations uh, among families. And in this book, Suzanne uh, helps unpack the idea of free speech uh, but also, very importantly, I think, offer some very practical lessons and, and, and advice for how both uh, those of us in, in, in the political debates, public debates, should exercise free speech, conduct it, but then also uh, be on the receiving end and, 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 and how listen, we, should, we should be able to listen better when it comes to free speech. Um, Suzanne touches a lot of very uh, important hot button issues in this book, and she does so uh, with great care and great insight. Uh, she's the CEO of an organization that champions free speech, PEN America, and has great experience uh, in and out of government, working on human rights and free speech issues, uh, holding senior positions before joining PEN America, senior positions at Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch. So I really, I can think of no one better uh, to, to uh, have, join us today to talk about this and to write about these issues. I should also mention that Suzanne is an old friend of mine. We've worked together for many years uh, in government and out of government. Uh, so it's a great personal pleasure to welcome her here uh, to this virtual book talk. Uh, so Su Suzanne, it's great to have you. Uh, welcome. If you're muted, I think. Thanks so much. Uh, it's great to be here with you, Derek, and uh, uh, I really appreciate it. I think, I think we, May have last seen each other. Uh, one of the times was uh, a book event for your book That's right. here, here at my apartment. Yeah, That's right. exactly. So unfortunately, it's not quite as good to return the favor here over Zoom. But I, I'll, uh, uh, you know, I'll do my best. Um, yeah. Well, favorite. Suzanne, what I wanted to do to start out, and, and we're going to have a conversation, and then we'll open it up to the audience uh, through Q and A, the Q and A in the uh, in the chat function. Um, but really to talk about, as a way to talk about the book itself, like the title, Dare to Speak. Um, I know a lot of thinking goes into book titles uh, and, and there's a lot of meaning packed into that. And I think in particular, I, I was noting both the title and the cover itself with the red line through the word speak. And so use that as a way to talk about, uh, you know, why you wrote this book about free speech, why now, and, and, and what you're trying to do with this book. Yeah, sure. I'll talk a bit about that and then I'll come to the title in a, in a sure. moment. So this really grew out, it's, it's interesting because PEN America, uh, I've been there for sort of six, six and a half years and I'd say for the bulk of that time or the, the, maybe half that time, we were principally focused on threats to free speech overseas. And the idea was we were an organization of writers here in the United States that could use their voice to speak out on behalf of those who paid the highest price, you know, whether in China or Iran or elsewhere for what we here in this country uh, were used to doing freely. And over the last four years, that mission has changed. And I would say that the America in Pan America took on added significance for, you know, sort of reasons obvious and maybe less obvious. Uh, Trump has had a lot to do with that, and we've stepped up dramatically our work on press freedom rights, assembly rights, disinformation. But we also uh, became concerned about another set of threats to free speech, and this grew out of work really on college campuses that started 
Several years ago with, I'm sure some of you remember the conflagrations at Yale at the University of Missouri, uh, you know, and then kind of cascading to Berkeley and Middlebury and other places, violent confrontations in some instances. And we started to look into it. And what I came to as part of that examination was that there was a brewing tension between the drive to make this country more equal, inclusive, just, anti-racist, and robust protections for free speech on the other side. And that these interests seem to be coming into clash. And the, you know, the classic example was, you know, a speaker like Charles Murray uh, associated with a book widely considered to be racist. It was a book, uh, you know, written decades ago, but he was invited to Middlebury, and it, it triggered this, you know, absolutely censorious protest where, you know, a, a planned lecture that he was going to give, you know, ended up in a melee where a, a professor was severely injured and the event had to be completely shut down. And there were many other similar instances. And so that came to worry me. I, I started to worry that we were at risk of losing a rising generation to the principle of free speech. And, you know, with Penn as a free speech organization, you know, that has to be of concern. And as I unpacked it, you know, what, what I observed is that when you sort of got to speak to these students and go to campuses and talk to faculty and bring people together from across the political spectrum, that you could explain and articulate how the principles of free speech and of inclusion and equity were not at odds, were not kind of categorically in opposition, that they could fit together. And in fact, that each one could make the other more, uh, more robust, uh, more appealing and attractive but that that argument was sort of being lost. And actually we've had a program over the last several years that has really focused on trying to explain that linkage and articulate a version of free speech. You know, I think of it as sort of an enlightened free speech that is more compatible with these objectives of equity uh, and inclusion. And so the title, you know, we debated over the title, uh, you know, as I think always happens. And I, you know, I didn't like anything. <laughs> and I wasn't necessarily crazy about Dare to Speak when it first came up, but I have to say it's grown on me. And that's because, you know, I find even for myself on a lot of issues, whether it's, a, you know, a tweet or an op-ed or something else that I'm thinking about saying or writing, you know, I sort of think in the back of my head, like, dare to speak indeed, you know, like there's a risk here. There's, you know, people may get upset about this. Uh, you know, there may be blowback. It may rub some people the wrong way. You know, could this blow up on Twitter? And so there is that element of having to have a certain amount of courage in speaking out. And I think that's extremely important. And the book is really an admonition and an encouragement uh, uh, for people to do that. And as well as a whole set of practical steps to in my mind, enable you to do that while minimizing the risk of, you know, winding up in some intense conflict. And then the other piece I would say that's important about the title is defending free speech for all. And it's really the for all that has become kind of a centerpiece of our work because we also put a lot of emphasis on the fact that the marketplace for free speech has really never been a level playing field and that there are so many groups and individuals who are excluded for you know a whole variety of reasons uh socioeconomic status lack of educational opportunity systemic bias that affects fields like publishing uh newsrooms uh hollywood entertainment you know i'm sure it exists in the think tank world uh in washington as well and that part of realizing free speech also must entail dismantling those obstacles yeah, and that's, it's a really good point on, in terms of the title, the dare to speak, because you're not, you're not advocating for reckless speech. And I think that's one of the more interesting things about uh, what, what, what you argue, because as I said, you're, you're, talk, you're giving us sort of pointers on how to speak, but also how to listen. And there's some several interesting concepts you offer uh, that I think are really useful. Uh, for example, linguistic conscientiousness. So describe what that is. Yeah, sure. Uh, 
And it's funny where that idea originated. I'll just give you uh, a quick notion. This is at the very beginning of our work on campus, which really before we had started, but it was what, when those controversies were bubbling up at Yale and the University of Missouri, I, I was at a meeting at Wellesley College of free speech experts from around the world. And people were really up in arms about these calls for safe spaces and lists of microaggressions to be enumerated and banned on campus and students calling asking to be protected from noxious speech. And, you know, we were all sort of like, you know, this is, they're going in the wrong direction. They're, you know, they're snowflakes. Uh, you know, they haven't been brought up to tolerate all this. And then there was a student uh, who was in the audience who put up her hand and, and spoke up and she said, you know, what's so wrong with asking for linguistic conscientiousness? And she just kind of struck me as this very level-headed, calm, young woman, it turned out she was the president of the student body. And for me, that was like a moment that clicked because what I could see there was that these were absolutely rational kind of middle of the road young people who were recognizing that for some classmates, there were vulnerabilities to speech that were genuine. And so linguistic conscientiousness, as I set out in the book, is essentially the responsibility that I think we all have to consider who is in our audience. You know, when we're speaking today, this is not the 1950s where you're publishing an, uh, you know, a letter to the editor in your local paper and you can assume that just about everybody who reads it is, you know, was educated, raised the same way that you were. You know, that's no longer the case. You post it on social media, it could blast all over the world. And even here in this country, our population is rapidly becoming more diverse and we have to take account of those differences when we speak and consider how our language our choice of words the metaphors that we use may strike different people and that could be include people of different uh genders people with disabilities i mean i you know sort of using the phrase which i i still i sort of like this phrase but i also realize how it's probably just to you know stand up for human rights well that implies you know the ability to stand up and so for the dis for disabled people that's considered uh an exclusionary phrase and and you know so maybe if you're write writing to a broad audience you know maybe if i'm standing if i'm writing in a book if i'm signing someone's book and saying thank you for standing up for for those who dare to speak maybe that's okay writing to that one person but if i'm speaking to a broad audience of all sorts of people maybe i want to pick something different that uh is not going to exclude or uh, uh, rankle in that way. And so, you know, there are all sorts of ways you can familiarize with yourselves with how these norms are changing. And, you know, things do change. Pronoun use, you know, is something that a lot of us have had to get up to speed with, uh, you know, in the past few years. And, you know, initially there's sort of this unease and, you know, people are saying it's ungrammatical and, you know, kind of resisting it using people's prop, you know, first name rather than uh, a non-traditional pronoun, uh, you know, but really this is about accepting people for who they are, calling them the way they want to be designated and a, you know, a matter of respect and a step toward a more inclusive society. So that's sort of what I set out and I try, you know, I try to make it sort of simple and straightforward in terms of how you can be conscientious without tying yourself up in knots. Mm -hmm. It, and I think this important concept uh, of duty of care, which which you uh, outline, which is which is this linguistic conscientiousness is part of that, of course. And I guess on the other side of it, though, there's this question of of what happens and what are the consequences when there is a deep lack of linguistic conscientiousness. Um, and 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 this whole issue that, that you you get into, which is which. It's written about every day, this idea of cancel culture, the idea that, that um, you know, certain speech is so over the line that the pers that severe consequences are warranted. And, and you talk about how complicated that is. And, and I'd like to, you know, for you, for the audience to talk a little bit about how you think of that. Just yesterday in the New York Times, I read an article by uh, a journalist who had who'd written a lot about cancel culture uh, over the last several years, but was writing an article saying they never want to use the term again because of, of you know, the lack of nuance in it. 
But nevertheless, you do acknowledge, as we all do, that there is certain speech that is off limits and should be off limits, um, but that there's an importance for, you, you talk about intent and context. Um, so I guess, when are the call outs justified to your mind? Yeah, sure. I mean, I do think the term can cancel culture is used so elastically, it's become almost meaningless. So, you know, on the one hand, it's a Harvey Weinstein and a Bill Cosby who are canceled. You know, on the other hand, it's you know a professor who put out one errant tweet and mm -hmm. uh, you know is 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 facing the, the 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 wrath of the internet because of it. You know, I I talk about settings in which uh, I think callouts are appropriate and ones where I urge calling in, which is a more private version of t sort of taking someone to task for something that they've said, but in a much gentler way. And I think there are many circumstances where that private call in, you know, taking someone aside or sending them a little private email instead of the reply all, uh, you know, or picking up the phone even and saying, you know, the way you worded that could be construed as dismissive to our interns uh, or, you know, giving that gift, you know, there's a, a recent example of a top editor in a magazine who was used to giving out uh, uh, the elements of style, Strunk and White's The Elements of Style, you know, as a, as a kind of gift, but he gave it to his uh, black assistant and it wasn't well received. It was sort of seen as a, uh, you know, commentary on her writing skills. And, you know, perhaps that's something if someone had noticed that, uh, you know, the person maybe who was ordering the gift, you know, it could have been gently pointed out. And I think a call in is appropriate where you think the person may be receptive, where you don't think they're uh, intentionally wanting to cause offense or, uh, or, or behaving recklessly with the possibility of causing offense, but that they are basically a conscientious person who is unaware of, you know, that something that they have said or done may be received the wrong way. And, uh, you know, where you think the behavior can be corrected, maybe there's an opportunity to apologize or to pull back. I think a call out is appropriate where you think the person is recalcitrant, that they're not, uh, you know, they're not going to listen. They're, uh, you know, either willfully or negligently, uh, you know, speaking in ways that are likely to offend where the offense has already occurred, where, you know, someone has said something in front of a classroom and a hundred people have heard them, you know, then you kind of do need to speak out because there may be people in that audience. If it was a sexist comment who felt wounded by that, isolated by that, marginalized by that, and stepping up and being an ally, signifying that that uh, is not considered acceptable, that there are people who are on the side of those, that this was heard and listened to and uh, re registering that objection publicly, I think is important in that context. And, you know, the question is really, you know, is, do you need that element of shame? Like, is there a reason to shame the person? I think where you think it's inadvertent, accidental, maybe clueless, you know, I don't think shame necessarily helps. You know, if somebody becomes, and I also worry about the, the chilling effect of it, because if you, you know, uh, experience shame as a result of an inadvertent offense, you know, maybe there's something good about that because you're, you have a heightened conscientiousness then, you know, going forward of what the taboos are and you'll be more careful, but there can also be a uh, real kind of closing down where it becomes fearful to speak out. You just sort of think the better of talking about controversial topics because there's such a great risk of you know, stepping over some invisible red line. I think a lot of people feel that right now. I and mean, there are a lot of topics, you know, like race that are just really hard to talk about right now. I give an example in the book of, of Me Too a few years ago, uh, you know, this, this very funny Saturday Night Live skit where they're trying to talk about Me Too. And, you know, each person's like, well, I think that, you know, and then the other person sort of goes, wait, wait, watch out, watch out, you know. So it's like nobody can get a sentence out because you're so afraid that, you know, there's just no way to put what it is that you have to say that isn't going to end up, you know, getting someone's back up. So I think that's a situation that we want to avoid. And through conscientiousness, through openness to forgiveness, through calling in where appropriate, you know, we can lower the temperature and make it more possible to talk about all sorts of things that, really, you know, we really need to discuss. We need to be able to talk about race and sexism, you know, and all of, all of these other issues, they cannot be off limits. Right. And, and the other interesting uh, point you make that's related to this is this question of, of harm and, and, the, and the idea that hurtful speech uh, can do harm, of course, but you do state very clearly that, that 
although it can cause genuine harm, that we don't want to overstate that all the time. And I mean, that itself is a controversial statement, I think, today. And, and, and talk about that a little bit. I mean, how you're thinking around that and, and, and how do those lines get drawn and who draws them? Um, uh, because you know, part of again, you're, part of what you're trying to do is this is a this is a challenge to citizens, to, to those of us uh, who you know who we want to express ourselves, but you're putting this is a lot of responsibility on us, and it's it's trying to create a cultural shift here uh, with this your argument. Yeah, no, and I think it's controversial on both sides. I mean, there has been a uh, you know sort of in this free speech world. Um, there have been some influential writings. I'd, I'd cite particularly Greg Lukianoff and Jonathan Haidt, who wrote this book, The Coddling of the American Mind. It's really all about how sort of the risks and harms of speech have been exaggerated, and that ideas like safe spaces and trigger warnings grow out of a style of child rearing that is helicoptering and overprotective and that we're raising a generation of young people who are not resilient, who don't have a tough skin, who sort of can't deal with and get so upset by uh, uncomfortable speech that they call for it to be shut down. And they advocate a kind of whole series of cognitive behavioral therapy and other measures to, you know, sort of um, toughen up these kids essentially. And, you know, look, I think they have a valid point. And I, you know, I see this in daily life, even at Penn, sometimes with, you know, junior staff or, you know, seem to have this kind of radar for offensiveness that, you know, is very far reaching and anything that could conceivably upset anyone, you know, they sort of flag it and question it. Um, so I absolutely think they're onto something. But I think one thing that happens sort of in the wake of that uh, book being published and also the fact that Greg runs this organization, the Foundation for Individual Rights in Education, which is really sort of the leading organization that deals with campus free speech. And they're a wonderful organization. If someone you know, professor, uh, you know, gets disciplined for something they've said, like I would say absolutely call fire because, you know, they've got lawyers and they jump on it and they really know the issues. But I worry at the same time that but this message that the harms of speech are exaggerated was put forward without what I see as an essential counterpart, which is that the harms of speech can be very real. And that particularly when it comes to demeaning and denigrating speech that's directed at people throughout their lives, you know, people of color who sort of, you know, wherever they go and out on the street and in stores, you know, they're subject to constant stereotyping and uh, assumptions made about them, you know, people treating them as if they're wait staff when they're, you know, there to be part of the meeting. You know, that kind of pervasive mistreatment has grave psychological, you know, academic and even physiological consequences, and that's been documented. And so we're, you know, I, th I think it's sort of a problem for free speech defenders to be seen as dismissive of the harms of speech. And I think there has been sort of that propensity because owning up to those harms, it, has, it is feared could open the door to censorship. So, you know, sort of a, a, an impetus to downplay those harms. I actually think our argument in this day and age is strengthened by being forthright in owning up to those harms and really recognizing that speech you know, can be, you know, more than just hurtful, but really, you know, shape people's identities and sense of self and their uh, agency in the world, their economic and professional opportunities, and that we have to push back aggressively against hateful speech and particularly hate crimes. And that's, that's actually, to me, part of the work of defending free speech is condemning hateful speech and rejecting it. And, you know, we've seen that, you know, working at the State Department. Uh, I remember when we had this crazy pastor in Florida who wanted to burn a Quran. And, you know, it became kind of an international incident that we were dealing with. And under the First Amendment, he was permitted to do that. And yet we had the senior most officials in our government, uh, Secretary of State Hillary Clinton, uh, Bob Gates at the Pentagon, condemning this. And, it, you know, it was really powerful because Muslim Americans and Muslims around the world, uh, you know, sort of understood that even though this act was going to take place, which to them was um, 
deeply objectionable and insulting that they had the support of these voices on their side, recognizing that, you know, a purely symbolic act, is it really, you know, uh, you know, could nonetheless be something, uh, you know, really pernicious and hurtful. So I think owning up to those harms of speech uh, strengthens the defense of free speech rather than the opposite. Mm -hmm. I definitely want to get into the international dimensions of this uh, in a second. But before I do that, just to focus once more on here in the U.S., one thing that I thought was very interesting in your book that I found myself reflecting on is the evolution politically of the idea of free speech. And I'm thinking back, you know, probably when I first heard about the free speech movement, it was associated with Cal Berkeley in the 1960s, the civil rights movement, um, which, which, you know, put free speech really on the map, I think, in our, in our political consciousness. Uh, but yet today, I think it's probably more associated with an issue of the political right. Um, and, and why is that? I mean, what's, what's your diagnosis of this kind of the journey this idea has traveled over the last 50 years or so politically here? Yeah, I mean, one of the arguments I make is that, you know, to, is really too directed toward the left uh, and, and focused on how free speech protections have over time been most useful for whether it's, uh, you know, dissenters or communists or labor organizers or, you know, the early reproductive rights movement or draft resistors. Those are the people who have been most uh, vulnerable to government encroachments on free speech and, and, and have gotten the most benefit from free speech protections. I think, you know, when it comes to sort of civil rights and anti-racist activism, I think it has to do with the fact that decades ago, you know, during the Martin Luther King civil rights movement, they were working on dismantling structural barriers to equality, you know, getting the schools and the lunch counters and the buses integrated. And now we're at a different level where, you know, there is that formal equality within our institutions and we're trying to tackle this much more uh, subtle and I think stubborn layer of individualized bias and, you know, uh, how we look at each other and treat each other and, you know, what ingrained perceptions we have uh, of, of one another based on race. And, and so it implicates speech in a very different way, you know, whereas years ago it was about the right to go out and, and demonstrate and march through the streets of uh, Selma, Alabama, uh, over the Edmund Pettus Bridge, you know, now it's about, you know, how people are treating each other in a dining hall or a classroom or a job interview. And so their, you know, speech rights were what, you know, supposedly uh, stopped the police from interfering with your ability to express yourself and to advocate and to protest. Uh, and, and drive media attention, uh, you know, so, so free speech ex uh, protections and press freedom protections were extremely important for that, you know, whereas today, uh, you know, free speech protections, you know, seem to safeguard this noxious speech that interferes with the attainment of this next level of equality and inclusion. And, you know, one point I've made over the last few months is, is that actually the protests over the murder of George Floyd and others have, you know, kind of brought to the foreground just what a, a, a heavy st hefty stake the left has in free speech protections. And, you know, Donald Trump has made that so plain by being clear about what he, you know, wanted to do in response to these protests, what he would have done, you know, had it not been for certain institutional and political constraints, you know, rooted in the First Amendment. So, I'm hoping that that kindles kind of a new awareness to some degree among young progressives that they do have a stake in these rights. Uh, well, I'd, I'd like to move now to the international dimension of, of this and also to integrate in some, some questions from uh, our listeners. And one of them comes from, I believe, a former colleague of yours, Ricky Goldstein, who uh, says that, uh, you know, this, this American notion uh, of free speech is at odds with the human, international human rights, legal right to free expression, which is more restrictive uh, than we have here. And of course, we're the German Marshall Fund and, and uh, uh, yeah. you know, you know, many viewers from Germany and Germany has, you know, very, you know, serious restrictions on free speech for very good reason. Um, 
So I guess the question is, and this is what Ricky asks, is isn't the internationally recognized definition uh, what the critics of American free speech absolutism are calling for, even if they don't cite it? Yeah, uh, and I, that is an international human rights treaties, you know, that allow governments to also restrict speech on, on uh, that incites racial hatred or discrimination or violence, of course. Uh, but how you see this, the kind of the debate unfolding here about free speech with this broader debate within liberal democracies, uh, particularly those that are more restrictive than, than the United States on these issues. Yeah, no, I mean, I think it's, it's, it's a good question. And I think you're right that at least theoretically adopting something closer to the international legal standard, which gives more leeway for governments to police speech, you know, would be in line with what I think a lot of young people sort of think they want. Uh, and, you know, this is an issue that, uh, you know, I dealt with a lot and we can get to it uh, in a moment at the State Department, that particular divergence between the international legal standard for uh, the protection of free speech and the U.S. First Amendment standard, which is more protective. You know, what I think is that, you know, I, I wouldn't say uh, that the approach adopted by the Germans or the Canadians is necessarily, you know, categorically inferior or something that we should absolutely re uh, rule out. But nor do I see evidence that it is effective in uh, helping to tamp down in any real or lasting way the noxious attitudes that are at the core of, you know, what people are worried about when they call for more expansive government powers to police speech. And I also think they have some downsides, like I actually just happened to look at, uh, you know, of course, in Germany, uh, Holocaust denial and other forms of anti-Semitic speech are prohibited. And, you, you know, we can all understand the justification for that, you know, and I, I just happened to look at the statistics in terms of anti-Semitic incidents, the rise in anti-Semitic incidents in the US and in Germany, you know, over the same period of a year, you know, the, 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 the most recent year during which those statistics uh, have been reported and like, the increase is exactly the same. Like it's gone up like 12% in the US and like 13% Germany. So is, you know, are those German laws, you know, managing to scrub this out? It doesn't seem that way. Uh, and, you know, we, and I know, you know, within Germany, there are serious concerns that about, you know, uh, rising resurgent anti-Semitism uh, and other forms of extremism and radicalism. So I don't see that the laws work, there may be the occasional prosecution that gives someone a sense of satisfaction. But when you're talking about sort of, you know, what is it going to take to get it at, at the root causes of bigotry, I don't think these laws are the answer. You know, and then the other thing that we see is sort of, you know, the, the, you know, the question of who implements and applies and interprets these laws. And I think when young people here in this country call for more expansive government restrictions on speech, they're sort of fantasizing about like a Thurgood Marshall, AOC, you know, RBG, Barack Obama, you know, Oracle, who would decide, you know, what is bad speech and, you know, get rid of, you know, exactly that which we'd rather not hear. Uh, but that, of course, that's not how it would work. I mean, right now it would be the Trump administration, the Trump Justice Department that would be responsible for those prosecutions, uh, you know, would be judges of varying political stripes who would interpret any such laws. And I think, you know, when you afford that discretion on balance to government, it's going to be used in self-serving ways to protect the prerogatives of that government. And, you know, we see that in Germany and many parts of Europe, that they're kind of these uh, examples that people, um, many people view as sort of going against the nature and spirit of these laws, whether it's, you know, suppressing Palestinian speech because it's, it's considered anti- Israel and anti-Semitic, or, you know, in France, uh, the woman who, you know, called out her Me Too accuser and then, uh, you know, was uh, prosecuted for doing that. You know, there, there are all kinds of distortions in how these laws end up being used. And I think there's no perfect system, but that on balance, we're better off with our more restrictive uh, conception of what what government's role is in regulating speech. And, you know, even despite the international standard being different, I, I, you know, I would say there's enormous respect for the American standard. I mean, because I had to negotiate this uh, at the UN Human Rights Council. We were often in the position where, you know, we simply couldn't sign on to language that followed international law because uh, it, it didn't mesh up with our own law. 
And people actually, you know, sort of understood that. And, you know, in one major instance that I was involved in, you know, the, the UN resolution actually uses the US standard of uh, incitement to imminent violence. And that was sort of out of a recognition that even though we depart from the international legal approach that there is merit to, uh, you know, the, the First Amendment uh, way of looking at this. Well, uh, you raise an issue that I wanted to get into and it's just your experience as a diplomat uh, working at the State Department, working at the UN on these issues, how that has influenced your, your thinking on these issues. You alluded to one, just the practical matter of negotiating in the Human Rights Council. Uh, uh, but, you know, whether there were experiences you had in government on foreign policy that, that, that shaped your thinking on these issues and, and what you hope that this book and, and the, the conversation around this book can help bring to the more international discussion around these issues. Yeah, I mean, look, the book, in a sense, I say this uh, in the preface, was sort of born of an experience that I did have at the State Department, which was when I was wor uh, kind of overseeing U.S. re-engagement at the U.N. Human Rights Council back in 2009, when the Obama administration rejoined. Well, one of the issues on the docket there was this uh, resolution by the Organization of the Islamic Conference at the time on uh, this so-called defamation of religion, and it grew out of the Danish cartoons controversy and the uh, uprisings outside Danish diplomatic installations around the world, really riots that were in some cases deadly, and the concern that those delegations had to be seen to be doing something on the issue of religious intolerance toward Muslims. And you know, the something they came up with was this resolution to ban the defamation of religion, so all kinds of religious insults, and they wanted to turn that into a binding treaty. And so we were doing battle with them twice a year, once in New York, once in Geneva, uh, over this resolution that we and other Western delegations saw as a clear infringement upon freedom of speech. And to me, kind of reading into this, it seemed like a ridiculous exercise. We were rallying votes, they were rallying votes against us. You know, at the same time as the Obama administration, as you know, you know we were no fans of anti-Muslim sentiment. We were sort of doing all kinds of things here in the US to try to, address it and you know there were, there were all manner of outreach was going on and so having this fruitless battle uh you know seemed inimical to our goals and so what we came up with really was a different approach and the idea of going to the islamic conference and saying you know would you consider getting behind a resolution that would focus on practical measures to actually address this underlying concern of religious intolerance but and at the same time dropping your agenda to ban and punish speech. And I ended up going to Islamabad basically to present this to the Pakistanis when they were in the leadership of the conference. And, you know, the measures were things like dialogue and education and getting hate crimes prosecutors from around the world together and looking at best practices. And, you know, it ultimately, I mean, I would say it didn't go over right away. It took a little bit of time, but ultimately they came around to the idea that it was better to get the whole world behind an agenda of fostering religious tolerance than to just, you know, have these battles year after year. And it ended up in a consensus resolution that the economists called a, a diplomatic coup for the Obama administration. And to me, what it illustrated was sort of that there is potential to, for reconciliation on these issues. And that, you know, ultimately it's, it, you know, it's, the issue is quite parallel to what we see in this country because it's about this tension and the propensity to, in response to intolerance, you know, turn in the direction of the suppression of speech. And that the idea that the suppression of speech, of noxious speech is sort of the answer to intolerant attitudes, which, you know, I don't think it is. Uh, and I think it has other negative consequences, but that doesn't mean that you're dismissive of the problem of intolerance. If you say, look, you're absolutely right. The intolerance is a serious problem. We need to do a whole series of things to address that. It's just that, you know, this isn't the right method and measure and, and here's why. You know, I actually think that turned out to be a compelling argument for the OIC and I'm hoping it's a compelling argument in this book. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, re related to, to this issue is something that's very topical for today and for the last several years, which is this issue of foreign interference in, in American democracy and, you know, foreign actors using American free speech to either spread disinformation or 
amplify divisive uh, uh, messages. And that's some, this is an issue that, that through the Alliance for Securing Democracy here at GMF, we've spent a lot of time focusing on and trying to raise public awareness and, and, and call for uh, action to, to try to combat. Um, and, you know, I'd like to get your, your thoughts on this issue and how, because obviously it's, it's directly related to, to free speech. And, and also, you've, you're, you offered a, a healthy degree of skepticism in the book about uh, having, how we decide on, on, on speech, you know, and whether it should be in the hands of governments or corporations and sort of the role that uh, we should expect the, the Twitters and the Facebooks and, and others to uh, sort of police their, their, their speech and their sites. And so talk a little bit about how you see this issue uh, evolving, how you think that, you know, efforts to address foreign interference in our democracy bumps up against what we hope, what we need to see in terms of our free speech rights here in the United States, um, and who's responsible, who, who should act on this? Yeah, sure. And this is a concern that at PEN America we uh, have been wrestling with really since the 2016 election. We did a big report called Faking the News uh, that looked at the role of fraudulent news in the election context and really sort of set out how even though overwhelmingly it is expression that is protected by the First Amendment. I mean, you are allowed to lie and dissemble and uh, you know, even mislead, uh, you know, in, in a political context. And there's a very kind of porous boundary between, you know, the usual types of political, uh, you know, kind of manipulation uh, or aggressive campaigning, negative campaigning, and the sort of thing that we see now. But that nonetheless, uh, you know, and I have an essay that opened up the report, uh, you know, arguing that this nonetheless represents a grave threat to free speech because if our discourse becomes so polluted by false information and uh, actors and speakers whose origins and identity and motives we don't know, yeah, you know, we really lose the ability, you know, what, why do we protect first free speech in the, per, in the first place? It, you know, one of the principal rationales is the idea that an open marketplace for ideas is going to, you know, allow truth to come to the foreground, allow the best uh, and most innovative ideas and, uh, to rise to the surface. And if you have these uh, deliberate uh, efforts at, at polluting that discourse, it, it stands in the way of the very purpose of free speech and, you know, the ability to persuade, to win an audience, you know, to advance uh, a compelling argument. And so, I think it's a real danger, you know, for us when we examined it, we uh, had, you know, there's sort of three levels that you can look at it, uh, you know, getting at the source and trying to stop the people who are behind this, which is incredibly difficult. And I think, you know, really hard to do within the confines of the First Amendment and the kind of system that we have. Uh, you know, then there's the role of intermediaries, the platforms and, you know, the, the vehicles by which we gain this information, then there's the end user. And how can we, the question of how we can inoculate uh, the population against disinformation. And we have, you know, I'd say focused on the, the second two pieces of that. And we've actually done a lot of work over the last six months on trying to begin to inoculate a segment of the population uh, against misinformation and disinformation, educate people about what to look out for, how to be skeptical, how to verify what they're seeing, how to avoid being a vector for the spread of disinformation. I think ultimately that's an extremely, you know, that has to be part of like our basic education. Uh, you know, and it was not something, you know, looking at all those books behind you on the shelf, like every one of those went through, you know, an editor and a publisher and probably a fact checker, you know, uh, and that's the world, you know, of knowledge that you and I grew up in. Our kids are growing up in a very different world of knowledge where it's all online and very little of it has been vetted in the ways that, uh, you know, we were accustomed to uh, decades ago. And so I think that has to be a real culture change in how we educate students and how people, uh, you know, navigate this information landscape. I do think with the platforms that we're learning a lot right now about the control of, of misinformation, disinformation, the pandemic has actually been 
pretty instructive because, uh, you know, they've done, uh, you know, I think a decent job both elevating credible information and, you know, everyone now sees this. If you type in COVID or coronavirus on Google or on Facebook, you know, the, right at the top of the feed, no matter what you may be looking for, hydroxychloroquine, but what's going to come up at the top is going to be information from the CDC and the WHO and state health authorities. And that I think is very positive. And they've really, you know, uh, adopted this new standard uh, of removing content that uh, is, is false and could cause imminent harm. So that includes sort of quackery and conspiracy theories, false cures for the coronavirus. And, you know, they've demonstrated that their algorithms and human content moderation methods are pretty capable of filtering out a tremendous amount of that. And, the, you know, now the big question is how, you know, how does this and should this translate to the political realm? And Facebook just announced, I think earlier this week or late last week, that they were going to be elevating credible information the way that they have with COVID. So you'll see, I think soon, we'll see, you know, state boards of election and other sources at the top of our feeds when we put in questions about mail-in ballots or other election-related topics. I think the much more dicey realm is, you know, this question of imminent harm and, you mm -hmm. know, what, what if anything, uh, you know, should be considered to cross that threshold in the realm of political information, because you can imagine sort of how subjective that is. I think there, there's some subjectivity in the medical realm. I don't think there are absolutes, but I think it's even more nebulous and murky in the political realm. You know, if someone's casting doubt on mail-in ballots, well, we see that as, you know, an affront and an outrage and, you know, an effort to undermine the election. Uh, you know, and yet we also know our, our balloting systems are not perfect. And there's some level of discussion of them that, you know, absolutely should be permitted and is needed. And so how far do we want the platforms to go in suppressing that? These are really hard questions. I, you know, I devote several chapters in the book to them. I ultimately think, uh, you know, we need to be kind of skeptical on, on both sides. Uh, we need to put whole platforms feet to the fire in terms of the harms that can be caused by online content, but also not give them unfettered, uh, non-transparent authority to police speech willy-nilly, because we know they don't do a good, good job, and we know they have their own motives, which don't necessarily comport with the public interest. Sure. Well, related to this issue and, and the good work that you've been doing at PEN America on uh, the foreign interference in American democracy and writ large, this is something that's not in the book, but it's directly related to the, what we're talking about, which is a recent report PEN America has put out on, on uh, China and Hollywood. And it, we, we posted it uh, in the chat for those of you who are interested in it. But I want to give you a brief chance to talk a little bit about that and how that relates to some of what we're talking about here right now. Yeah, sure. I mean, this is something, you know, we've done work at PEN America on China for a long time. And Lu Xiaobo was actually the president of the Independent Chinese Penn Center. And we uh, have done a lot of work on behalf of individual dissidents. And of course, it's gotten much harder to do any work at all within China. Uh, and we also have been involved in the establishment of a, a Hong Kong pen just over the last few years. And now that is being called into question. And it's not clear how that organization is going to be able to continue to operate. And, uh, you know, at the same time as it's gotten more difficult to work in China, it's also become clear that the implications of the Chinese approach to free speech are reverberating ever more powerfully at the global level, that the kind of long arm of uh, the Beijing government, which, you know, we saw, you know, was reaching into the near abroad uh, in cases like the Hong Kong booksellers, really goes much further and is now penetrating academia, the think tank world, uh, US businesses, obviously uh, new tech platforms and 5G, and also Hollywood, where in Hollywood, uh, increasingly Chinese investors uh, now play a huge role and ch access to the Chinese market. The China's, Chinese film market is, is fast outpacing the US to become the world's largest film market. And so what we see is producers and directors and script writers uh, increasingly internalizing Chinese red lines. So uh, it used to be a matter of more overt censorship and certain things being cut out of a film, uh, you know, in order for it to be able to enter China. And now- the Patches we, being changed on- military. Yes, and, and Top Gun. That's sort of the way, you know, one of the famous examples is, uh, you know, the old Top Gun from the 80s has the Taiwanese flag on the back of Tom Cruise's jacket. 
And then when they remade it, they sort of changed it into this neutral symbol, you know, uh, and what other explanation can there be for that? The rest of the jacket is a perfect, uh, is a perfect replica. So, uh, you know, and, and this has been happening really outside of public view and nobody in Hollywood wants to talk about it. It was actually a really hard report to do because nobody would go on the record and people were extremely skittish uh, about, you know, giving out names um, and talking about these incidents. And, you, you know, I, I also say a lot of, you know, quite um, thoughtful, uh, you know, I'd say, um, civically minded, left-leaning, free speech respecting people have kind of rationalized this, uh, you know, pretty, pretty thoroughly in the sense that they, you know, they will say, well, you know, it's better for 98% of the film to go into China than none of it. And, you know, this is part of cultural exchange and engagement. And I actually, you know, I don't dismiss those arguments. You know, we, we're an organization that stands for um, bridging across geographic, cultural, and ideological differences. And we do a lot with exchange and bringing writers from around the world uh, here in the US and vice versa. And so I agree with that, but I think the, the notion that this incredibly powerful industry that shapes so much of our storytelling and culture building is kind of, uh, you know, surreptitiously, surreptitiously uh, internalizing norms made in Beijing you know, which is absolutely happening. Like, you know, it's really pretty scary. And it's something that we need to be talking about. There was just a new edict that came out yesterday about science fiction. The China, Beijing government has decided that kind of science fiction is in their interest, but they also have some ideas about what it should entail. And it's, you know, Xi Jinping's thought, and it's, uh, you know, a glorification of Chinese culture. And, you know, that's what they're going to get behind. And every Chinese partner, of course, that you are working with if you're a Hollywood studio is tied into the Beijing government. I mean, there's no such thing as a truly, uh, you know, independent uh, film company there. And so, you know, th these are just the realities that we, I think we have to come to grips with and talk about. It doesn't mean, you know, as Penn, you know, we don't want to just be the finger wagging organization because I, you know, I think that's kind of pointless. And if you just, uh, you know, ask for an absolute just policy to reject the investment and, and uh, you know, wash your hands of the Chinese market, that's never going to happen. So I think we have to talk in much more kind of realistic and pragmatic ways about what this influence means and how we're going to grapple with it and, you know, and, and what it means to uphold our own values. I mean, this is an industry that, you know, is built on creative expression. And, uh, you know, so our, you know, our main point is that uh, this needs to be more out in the open and we need to grapple with it. Yeah. And it's obviously not something that just affects Hollywood. I'm just reflecting in the last, I don't know, six months ago, eight months ago, there was a big, big issue with the NBA, the National yeah. Basketball Association. And, and similarly, because of the importance of China as a market for the NBA, whether it's apparel or viewers of games, um, uh, you know, putting owners and players in a, in a similarly uh, interesting situation. Uh, we've got a little less than 10 minutes left. I want to fold in a couple more questions um, from our viewers. And, and I'll, I'll take one that's really focused on, uh, even though it comes from, from Ireland, it's, it's, it's a practical advice uh, that's being requested about something um, that applies to universities or, or think tanks or any organization that convenes, which is, um, you know, in your view, when is it okay in free speech terms uh, for an institution like a university uh, to, to not allow certain individuals a platform? Yeah, look, I think it depends on what the system is. In a lot of U.S. universities, there is a very liberal approach to who can come and speak on campus. So any academic department center or even student organization has the ability to issue an invitation to book a lecture hall and to host a speaker. And when you have that system, I think the university has to be uh, really take a hands-off approach to swooping in af afterward to deplatform individuals because, you know, in so doing, they're really undercutting that whole system. If you think about it, you know, if if I invite Charles Murray because I'm part of the conservative club uh, at Middlebury University, and you, as the university president, say you know, that's no good because it's going to offend students on campus, you're really uh, stripping away my authority to 
make those choices. And you're saying, you know, either there's an approved list of speakers or, you know, in essence, all of these requests, you know, have to go through a centralized system. And I think for the U.S. university, that would uh, erode this kind of free open inquiry uh, and the openness of the campus and the empowerment of different constituencies to create these dialogues and hear out uh, the views that they want to hear. I think it's different when the university is doing the inviting. You know, mm -hmm. when you're choosing, and you know, uh, uh, we talk about this in our, our campus speech work, when you're choosing you know, who's going to receive an honorary degree or speak at commencement or give a distinguished lectureship, you know, then I think there's also much more of an imprimatur of the university that is, you know, goes along with that appearance. And there is the implication that the speech is approved of. And of course, it's not a perfect line. I talk in the book about this incident at Bard College with Mark Youngen from the uh, AFD, who was invited to speak in a, at a conference about uh, the rise of fascism. And, you know, to me, that was a very appropriate setting for, uh, you know, to hear out views like Youngen's because you know, it was a group of academics. It was specialists uh, in this area. It's the Hannah Arendt Center. Uh, and, you know, I think they were well equipped to grapple with Youngen's ideas. They had Ian Baruma uh, as a counterweight to him. You know, and yet you still see Youngen can put on his Twitter, look, I, you know, I was invited to Bard. And, and, you know, for the, his audience, there's very little difference between, you know, you're invited to be the, you know, the straw man of fascism uh, at a conference and, and being invited, uh, you know, to give a lecture because we love your ideas. And so I think that risk can be mitigated, but not eliminated. Uh, but I, on balance, think this kind of, you know, and I, I don't know if it's, it's similar in Ireland in terms of this very decentralized system for invitations, but I think there's a lot of merit to that and mm -hmm. that universities should be loath to, uh, you know, Bigfoot uh, those mm -hmm. decisions. Mm -hmm. So uh, I guess a final question here uh, comes in from Jonathan Fowler, who this is back to the issue of disinformation uh, or amplification of divisive messages. And he uh, points out something I'd not heard of, I confess, the United Nations Verified Campaign, which is something that I'll, I'll check out after, after this concludes. But um, what he asks is, is your views on the role of multilateral institutions in combating misinformation? Because obviously this is something that we're not experiencing alone here in the United States. It's something that all liberal democracies uh, are are uh, experiencing and we can learn a lot from one another and how we handle it as sovereign nations, but there's also an international multilateral response, I think that's warranted as well. Um, yeah. How do you see that issue? I mean, I don't know a lot about the verified campaign. I know it has to do with COVID. I think a COVID promoted COVID related uh, credible information. And, you know, I think COVID is a good you know, probably a good, a relatively good test bed for some of this because it is, you know, obviously it's been politicized, but combating the epidemic at this point, um, you know, I, I think is, is a global concern where there are a lot of shared interests, uh, you know, where, you know, I think I would hope ideology and politics comes into it a bit less and there's more uh, potential to come to agreement about what constitutes credible information. And, you know, the, what would worry me is sort of in the political context, it's, it's really hard to envision, uh, you know, what potential there is because you have some governments, you know, for which this is a, you know, become a, a, a prime tool of statecraft. And mm -hmm. so, you know, are they going to agree to disarm? Is there any potential for that? Uh, you know, I think it's an interesting question to explore, but, you know, right now, uh, it's hard. It's hard to imagine, uh, you know, that that would happen voluntarily. The nature of these multilateral institutions and instruments is that you've got to get. You know, they're only as good as the participating states, and the participating states right now are, are at the heart of the problem. Right. Well, and it's particularly hard when one of the, I think, key states in trying to garner a multilateral response, uh, at least the the head of government. Uh, often traffics in this sort of stuff. Uh, right, I know it's a deliberate strategy. I mean, this, you know, like so. Uh, yeah, exactly, but. Yeah, you know, I mean, but that's not to say, you know, I, I, I think though, nonetheless, you know, norm development is a long process. Sure. And so I think there could be some merit in trying to get that ball rolling. And, you know, it, uh, it, it's not the case that you presume that at the outset, you're going to have universal agreement, you know, you, it very often works, you have a, a small kind of core crucible of states, and then you gradually 
work to build up that, uh, you know, what the norms uh, really involve and flesh them out and then to build wider political support and to isolate those who stand on the outside. So, you know, I think that kind of process is something we should be looking at. Mm -hmm. I mean, of course, the U.S., you know, right now at this moment is not well positioned to lead, but I think right. it should be on the agenda. Right. Well, Suzanne, we're out of time, but I'm going to ask one last kind of going out question, which is, uh, what surprised you the most in, in writing this book? Uh, obviously, you've, you've, you've worked on these issues for many years. You, leading PEN America, uh, have, have done incredibly innovative and important work uh, on free speech and championing free speech. Um, and, you know, this book uh, is written with a lot of passion and knowledge, erudition, uh, and well thought through argument. Um, like, did you change your mind on anything? Was there something that you, uh, you know, you said at the very outset that, that the title itself you didn't like so much, but now you've, it's grown on you. Is there, are there other things that you discovered along the way that, that uh, as you reflect on your experience yeah. in writing it? I mean, uh, there's something that sort of lingers with me, um, which is, you know, this question of online content moderation, these very thorny dilemmas between both wanting to expunge from the platforms the most noxious and you know manifestly harmful forms of content including disinformation that you know has the potential to perhaps even unravel our democracy you know and on the flip side the concern about giving the platforms limitless powers to adjudicate speech and you know what has struck me is no one really has an answer to that. You know, mm -hmm. I'm not, I mean, I know something about it uh, and I researched it for the book, uh, you know, but I've sort of always been kind of afraid, like I'll listen, I'll read articles or I'll listen to podcasts uh, from people who are deeply immersed in it, uh, you know, and almost worried, like, did I get it wrong or is there something I was missing? And, you know, what, I, what I'm struck by is that we're really at a very nascent stage of figuring that out. And, and yet there is a, a, a increasing drumbeat uh, for regulation. I think we will see in a new Congress uh, regulatory moves. And, and maybe it's, we just need to experiment because, you know, the fact is no one can, no one really knows what happens when you pare back Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act, uh, you know, the... Uh, limitation on liability and the, the comprehensive immunity that the platforms have. And, and perhaps the only way to find out is to uh, experiment at the margins of that. But, you know, what, what strikes me about all of it is just that this is the clear kind of next frontier in terms of the future of not just free speech, but, you know, so much about our discourse and the way our society works. And, you know, I am sort of find myself increasingly persuaded by these arguments that a lot of what ails us, you know, may derive at some level, you know, if you sort of ask, well, why the populism and neo-fascism now, you know, does this have something to do with the transition to digital communications? And I, you know, I think it may. And I think we're at a very early stage of figuring out how to, you know, gain control of it in ways that don't backfire. And so, you know, to me, it makes the field of free speech really interesting and just raises big, big questions about how we move forward next, uh, you know, on in, in areas that are, you know, so crucially important uh, and 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 yet have such looming uncertainties. Well, that's a that's a great note to end on uh, because I think we all appreciate the the importance of these issues. They've in many ways never seemed more important than they do right now, but also uh, understand how complicated they can be. And I think one of the great services you've uh, performed here in writing this book and talking about it is helping us give us the tools to, to think about it and, and to work through these problems. And you offer uh, uh, a lot of answers in this book, but you also raise a lot of questions that, that you don't yet have answers to. And I think that's why I would recommend your book as an important place to start the conversation. And uh, I'll look forward to your follow up uh, some some years from now, we can reflect on what on the journey we've traveled. Um, but Suzanne, thanks a lot for Thank your you time, so much, your, your time and doing this. Let me get my paper copy again. You can hold up your yes, you can see this. Yes. Uh, go out uh, to your local bookstore. Go online if you can go physically into the good bookstore. Go to your bookstore uh, to uh, purchase this book. Uh, I really, really appreciate, Suzanne, your time, uh, for, and thanks again for writing it. Thanks for being here. 
And I want to thank everybody uh, for joining us uh, here. And please stay safe and stay healthy. Thanks thank a lot, Derek. Take care. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.